Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. In this video, we will do a deep dive on metrics. Selecting the right metrics is super important to run an A-B test in practice because we want to be clear about the goal as well as how to measure the results before running it. Not only these metric-related questions often appear in data science interviews. It can be a straightforward question that asks you about the pros and cons of a specific metric. It can also be a question that asks you to formulate a metric for an online experiment. So as a data scientist, the knowledge of metrics is fundamental. In this video, we will start with business metrics, including goal metric, driver metric, and guardrail metric. Then we'll talk about how to formulate metrics for online experiments. The content of this video is based on not only my knowledge on metrics, but also a few new things I've learned from reading the book Trustworthy Online Control Experiments. I have learned quite a few things from reading that book, and I recommend it to anyone who is interested in learning about A-B testing. Okay, let's get started. There are three kinds of operational metrics that companies use to measure success and progress, and to understand areas for improvements. The first kind of metric is a goal metric. It's also known as success metric, true north metric, north star metric, OKR metric, and the primary metric. This kind of metric reflects a company's long-term vision, and it always ties to a company's mission. Goal metrics are a small set of metrics that a company truly cares about. I know it may sound abstract. How do we translate such a mission or vision to a set of metrics? Let me give you an example. Facebook's mission is to give people the power to build a community and bring the world closer together. And its goal metrics include advertising revenue, daily active users, and monthly active users. While the transformation from its mission to its goal metrics isn't perfect, the goal metrics do reflect what the companies ultimately care about. And they are simple enough to be easily communicated to different stakeholders, such as investors, customers, and employees. The goal metric should also be stable over a long period of time to allow the whole organization to work towards improving it. While goal metrics are critical to measure the overall success of a company, they may not be suitable for online experiments because they can be difficult to measure or may not be sensitive enough to product changes. For example, Facebook cares about ads revenue, but not every team could use it for A-B testing. There are teams focusing on improving user engagement and also teams focusing on website or native app performance. For such teams, what they do definitely contribute to the company's overall success, but they don't use those company-level goal metrics to measure performance. Compared with goal metrics, which are about the long-term vision, we also need metrics to reflect short-term progress. The driver metric, also known as surrogate metric, indirect or predict metric, are often used to measure short-term objectives. They align with the goal metrics, but they are more sensitive and actionable to be able to measure short-term progress and drive teams to work on it. That's also why they are better than the goal metrics to be used for A-B testing. Now, let me give you a concrete example of a driver metric. A marketing team's goal is to acquire new users, and one of the driver metrics could be the number of new users registered per day. The distinction between the goal metric and the driver metric is actually something new I learned from the book. Before reading it, I thought I knew what a success metric is. I have developed such metrics in practice and have used them to run online experiments. But after reading the book, I realized that I was wrong. What I thought of as success metrics were actually driver metrics. In fact, success metric is the same as the goal metric, and it's about the long-term vision. While the driver metric is used to measure short-term progress and is more suitable for online experiments. Check out this blog written by my friend Rob and me. It covers several metric frameworks which can be very helpful for you to understand what metrics are used in different business domains. The last category of metrics is the guardrail metric. As the name suggests, guardrail metrics guard us from harming the business and violating important experiments assumptions. In this book, it categorizes guardrail metrics into two groups, 
which I think is very helpful to understand different roles of guardrail metrics. The first one is the organizational guardrail metric. If this kind of metric shifts to the negative direction, the business will suffer significant loss. For example, if the loading time of a web page increased by a few million seconds, there can be a significant loss of customers and revenue. In practice, the page loading latency is often used as a guardrail metric when new features are developed and tested through A-B testing. A few other commonly used organizational guardrail metrics include errors per page and client crashes. The other kind of guardrail metric is trustworthy related metrics. They are used to monitor the trustworthiness of an experiment, that is to check if there is any violation of its assumptions. One of the common use metrics is to check if randomization units assigned to each variant is truly random. When the numbers in different groups are different, the authors refer this as sample ratio mismatch. We then need to perform a t-test or a chi-square test to check if the assignment ratio matches with what was designed. Now you know the definition of goal metrics, driver metrics, as well as guardrail metrics. In practice, we need to be clear about the context when talking about a specific metric, because the same metric can be used differently for different teams. One team's driver metric can be other team's guardrail metric. For example, one front-end team's goal is to improve web performance. So reducing latency is their goal and time to interactive TTI can be one of their driver metrics. A product team may use the same metric as a guardrail metric to make sure any product changes don't increase latency. Next, let's look at what are the attributes of a good metric. In the blog post I mentioned earlier, it has a few general rules to formulate metrics. A good metric should be simple. It's easy to understand and calculate, and people should be able to remember and discuss it easily. If you cannot use one sentence to explain a metric, it's not simple. Secondly, the definition of a good metric is clear, and there is no ambiguity in interpretation. Thirdly, a good metric should be actionable. The metric can be shifted by changes in products, and it offers insights on how you can improve. It should not be easily gamed. Gaming means that a metric makes you feel like you are getting results, but it offers no insights into actual business health or growth. Short-term revenue is an example of such a metric. Increasing prices of products may increase short-term revenue. However, the business may lose customers in the long run. We have talked about operational metrics, which are critical to major accounting or team's performance. However, not all of them are suitable for online controlled experiments. Next, let's go over what are the requirements of metrics that can be used directly for experimentation. In the book, the authors summarize three attributes for metrics that are suitable for experimentation. Measurable. We should be able to calculate those metrics with data collected during the experiment period. Attributable. We should be able to attribute metrics values to the experiment variants. It means that the metrics should be able to be calculated separately for different variants in the experiment. Sensitive and timely. Experiment metrics should be sensitive enough to detect changes in a timely manner. In online experiments, we typically select a few driver metrics as the key metrics, as well as some guardrail metrics to monitor impacts on other aspects of the business. Now, I want to share one question I get constantly. Since we have multiple metrics for an experiment, how do we make the launch decision when one metric goes up and one metric goes down? It's a very reasonable question, and this scenario happens often. In practice, many organizations have a mental model of the trade-offs they are willing to accept when they see any particular results. For example, trade-offs between user acquisition and revenue. How should the company strike the optimal balance between revenue maximization and user acquisition? Acquiring new users can always be done by expensive campaigns, such as providing large discounts or gifts but it will degrade revenue. This kind of trade-off is not something that can be determined by a single data scientist or a single data science team. It's something that is discussed and aligned 
among various stakeholders, such as product teams, marketing teams, engineering teams, and the leadership team, etc. Finally, I want to share with you two practical suggestions from the book on formulating metrics for experiments. One is to combine a few target metrics into an overall evaluation criteria, a weighted combination of the most important driver metrics, and use it as the only criteria for an experiment. If coming up with such an OEC is difficult, the authors recommend choosing no more than five metrics as their target metrics. There are two main disadvantages of having too many metrics. One is that too many metrics may confuse people and it may possibly lead to ignoring the key metrics. The other downside is including too many metrics may affect the decision making process and increase the chances of having false discoveries. Alright guys, I hope you have learned something new about the metrics in this video. In the next few videos, we will continue talking about interesting topics about A-B testing. Stay tuned, I will see you soon.